Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever it may be in your day. Welcome to the Master Craftsman Study Group Program through the Valley of St. Louis. And for our next evolution of this, uh, as we explore Master Craftsman philosophy, uh, or uh, as some will think beast, because we'll be tackling Master Craftsman uh, through the lens of the Scottish Rite philosophy as espoused by morals and dogma. Um, Albert Pike's seminal work. Uh, specifically, we're going to be looking at the annotated edition. So, brethren, just an overview uh, really quickly. Uh, this program is divided generally into 10 sections with quizzes, uh, 33 in number. Uh, or excuse me. Yeah, I believe 33 in number still, even with the change in programming. Um, and in any case, uh, typically when we discuss this with our own study groups here in St. Louis, we would bunch these in their sections so we do 10 uh rotations if you will um covering each section uh, for the course of these videos we're going to break that apart and cover each individual degree as its own set um as we discuss with our own participants very much um our slide decks are going to point you to things uh in general um but this specific program is very much about your own contemplation of morals and dogma, your own exploration of the text. Uh, so we're going to hit on some things, but you may, in your own reading, find plenty of other great fodder for discussion. We encourage you to keep digging into that uh, and enjoy this experience as we move forward. With that, we'll get started. So again, um, just as we give the, the warning to anybody participating, uh, if you're in this ex explicitly, if you're in the St. Louis study group, you need to have read all the material prior to listening to this. Uh, since we're breaking these down degree by degree, that makes it even a little easier on you to digest these at your own pace. Um, but please uh, make sure you've done that if you're participating solo uh, or in another jurisdiction or whatever it may be, uh, orient, whatever it is. Uh, that's up to you, but I would highly suggest you read before uh, going through these PowerPoints. So the first section we have is section one. It's quiz one to four, and it will address the um, introduction in Morals and Dogma, which begins on page 17, and then it goes all the way up through the Master Mason Lecture uh, which ends on page 180. Uh, so you're basically, you know, looking at about 160 pages of reading um, to work through. Uh, the introduction itself is what we're going to tackle right now. Uh, we'll go through that, and we will probably button that up um, pretty easily here. So the introduction, of course, talks to us is about Morals and Dogma talks to us about the Scottish Rite, its history, its development uh, in various ways. And it approaches some things we talk about in um, Morals and Dogma, or excuse me, <laughs> Esoterica in Master Craftsman Symbolic Lodge and some things we talk about, obviously, in History and Ritual. But a couple things to note here, obviously, Morals and Dogma is a collection of 32 essays, uh, which provide a philosophical rationale to these degrees, some background thoughts. Uh, these were designed as lectures primarily uh, originally for Pike's work that we see in like magnum opus ritual, which wasn't really officially adopted uh, and then was later tweaked and applied with a little bit. Uh, these don't completely line up to the lectures uh, we see in the 1880 ritual that was formally adopted. So there is some variation, um, slight, not really too much to notice in, in some ways and other ways it could be. Uh, but it, it is all encompassing enough to be a very functional tool for our own contemplation, our own reflection. So let's talk a little bit about the Scottish Rite in general. Let's talk a little bit about the background. Uh, when we look at the Scottish Rite, we look at Freemasonry, um, we have to realize the evolution of the ritual, the evolution of our fraternity. Um, prior to the formation of the Grand Lodge of England, uh, 1717, 1721, depending on who's who you want to back in that discussion. Um, Freemasonry, of course, was very, very opposite. It was trending towards speculative. And, and then, of course, uh, the solidification of that speculative nature comes in that early 1700s. 
At the formation of that Grand Lodge, there were only two degrees, Entered Apprentice and Fellow Craft. Um, several years later, 1725, we see the first recorded Master Mason degree conferral. Uh, that's on a man named Charles Cotton. Uh, and it's not conferred in a lodge, actually. It's conferred in a musical society. Um, so that's the first new degree on the block, really. Um, it is the first high degree. Uh, so in a way, I, I've often heard people say that, you know, the high degrees, the hot degrees, high degree masonry, hot degree, hot grades, however you want to title it, that came from Europe. That's a French thing. That's a German thing. Yada, yada, yada. Uh, well, the seed of it all was planted in, in England, in Britain. Um, and, and the Master Mason degree, of course, by 1730, we see exposés of it. Um, within a heartbeat of that, by the 1732, 1733, uh, we start seeing more rumblings. 1733 is when the Scotch Master Masons uh, begin to appear. Um, and, and from the 17, that point, in the mid 1730s through the 1740s, we see just uh, an explosion of Masonic uh, interest, Masonic degree work, rites, rituals, ideas, concepts, uh, primarily sparked by a very curious a very engaged in one way or another uh, membership. Um, brothers asking questions about why, how, wait a minute, what about this, what about that? Bringing in details from other accounts, classical stories, history, other points that they are aware of. Um, of course, um, we have these thoughts about, uh, you know, the Temple of Solomon being built and the Master Mason degree completed, yet, we know it was destroyed. Well, how does that stand within the frame of masonry? Um, and so, of course, we have the evolution of things that later become like the Prince of Jerusalem degree, Knight of the East and, uh, and of the Sword of the Eagle. Um, lots of things like that come out of this metamorphosis. Um, and, and inevitably, you have, you know, almost a thousand degrees being worked in Europe at this time. By the end of it, the seedlings of what becomes the American rite of masonry, the York rite, uh, begin to evolve also, obviously, uh, what becomes the Royal Arch degree, what becomes uh, later to be the commandery orders, things like that, are all fomenting, they're growing in different ways, attached to different bodies, some not. Um, and you have, especially in France, a hotbed of this, um, growth. Uh, and I like to say that everybody has to one up each other. So you have a group pop up and maybe they're the knights of this. Well, next thing you know, you have the princes of that. And later you'll have the, the emperors of such and such. Um, and inevitably what happens is at least in um, France, one of the major players was the council of emperors of the East and West uh, with their system of ritual. Um, these systems and others uh, of course grow they're active in France. They, they, a lot of them, at least in early development, came out of Bordeaux. Um, and were thriving. These bodies were thriving. And, and, of course, we call it the Scottish Rite. A lot of that tends to the fact that this is following the exile of the Stuarts uh, to continental Europe and, and everything that happened with that re uh, rebellion in England against the monarchy. Um the Stuarts brought with them a lot of Scottish expats. These men became active in masonry. They were active in these lodges. Uh, they were active in the aristocracy in one way or another in France. Um, and, and that kind of melded in um, to the system where we have what, what they start calling it echo say masonry um, in one way or another. So early 1760s hit. Um and a man by the name of Stephen Moran or Etienne Moran, a uh, spice merchant, um, won't go too much into him in depth other than to say he has an extremely interesting life. Um, very kind of interesting how things led to this point and then after. Um, but inevitably, beginning of the 1760s, he receives a patent from the Grand Lodge that was existent there in Paris at the time and the Council of Emperors of the East and West to spread perfect and sublime Freemasonry. Um, as such, uh, Moran kind of gets a blank check, at least in my mind of sorts. Um, and 
in his efforts, he more or less kind of coalesces the degrees that are floating out there, the best and the brightest. Uh, what had been systems would have been partial systems, things like that, into a, a cohesive system of 25 degrees, uh, the order of the royal secret. And this system, he then... Um, really locks into by 1763 uh and and of course after which he goes to kingston jamaica and it's there that he introduces it um the next year 1764 the order of the royal secret hits american soil in new orleans um and it's about in that time that he deputizes uh henry andrew franken who becomes kind of a catalyst for massive explosion to the scottish right um, he was a Dutch Mason. He travels all over. He introduces the Order of the Royal Secret to New York in 1767. Um, Franken ends up kind of doing a chain reaction of things. He appoints Moses Michael Hayes um, to be an inspector. Um, it goes down the chain farther and farther until we get to like Colonel John Mitchell, uh, who inevitably serves as the first sovereign grand commander. Um, so this Order of the Royal Secret it, it has some success. It, it isn't overly strong, um, but it does have bodies popping up. It does have functional bodies um, existent uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, there, of course, was the one in New York. Uh, they popped up in places like Charleston and, and other, elsewhere where these um, inspectors traveled. And Charleston had existent um, bodies. They were present um, in the early 1800s, and by the time Mitchell became involved and, and uh, the Reverend Friedrich Dalko um, and, and some of the other nine that composed the first Supreme Council members themselves upright, uh, were all involved. They were all involved in these earlier Order of the Royal Secret bodies, uh, which Mitchell and Dalko transform into this right of 33 degrees, adding several degrees to it obviously, and creating the Supreme Council 33rd degree uh, and the mother Supreme Council of the world and, and the right as it is composed. Take some time uh, within your reading. Uh, there's there's quite a stretch that discusses the early evolution um, of the Scottish right, the early evolution of uh, the councils, and we'll talk a little bit more about it, but do, do pay some attention to it. It is in the beginning. Uh, of course, with the early evolution of masonry in that first high grade degree, uh, that introduction was all about the Hiramic legend. Um, and that forms, of course, a backbone of what later trickles out through some of the other Masonic groups. Um, this Hiramic legend, this idea uh, of an individual being slain, um, we can find obviously in, in multitudes of other uh, cultural and religious circles. Uh, the text, of course, draws attention to uh, Martin Cl Clare comparing the Hiramic legend to Virg Virgil's Aeneid. Uh, there is, at least at once, there was, and then the text kind of disputes this out, but there was discussion, at least in one frame of Masonic thought at a time, that the legend was based on the murder of the pharaoh, uh, Senecre Tau II. Um, but in, in any case, this idea of an upright individual, uh, an upstanding being or a being in general, being slain and, and then renewal or rejuvenation following thereafter falls much into various other practices and faith ideas and, and religions and cultures and, and traditions. And the anthropological notion of a dying God represented by death brought by winter and the rebirth by spring, of course, traces through many of those. Uh, so that's just something to kind of keep in mind as we trace the basis of that Hiramic legend that later tripped the wire to all these other things. Now, of course, as we noticed, um, as I noted, excuse me, uh, Charleston, of course, is the location of the Mother Supreme Council of the World, uh, founded, of course, in Charleston by the Reverend Frederick Dalko. Uh, and it was called the, a myriad of names, the Supreme Council of Charleston um, being one of those. And, and in fact, the Grand Commander was at one point called the President of the Supreme Council. Uh, and I will note on here uh, that the Supreme Council actually opened on in 1801. 
Uh, it is a typo in my slide deck that it says 1802. Uh, but the Supreme Council was opened in 1801. Please note that. Uh, in any case, uh, the Supreme Council in Charleston was followed by those uh, in various other places. Uh, Supreme Council of France was 1804, Italy 1805, and Spain 1811. Um, there, of course, was also another Supreme Council uh, that isn't listed in this list, uh, but it was in San, uh, San or basically in Haiti, because uh, I can't talk today. And that was founded in 1802 uh, when Alexander Auguste de Grasse Tilly uh, had returned to that area. Uh, now, of course, when they opened the council in France, the agreement with the Grand Orient of France at that time uh, utilized the term Scottish in the rights and name. Up until that point, um, Scottish hadn't been used. It was the ancient and accepted right or, or variations thereof. Uh, calling it a, the Scottish Rite just hadn't been in practice. Uh, and, and you can actually see in other texts, um, and even up into Pike's time, various authors, Pike himself, referring to the Scottish Rite as the ancient and accepted right, rather than just the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite, which he uses as well in, in several places. In any case, um, these councils are established, and they utilize as their law um, the Grand Constitutions of 1786, said to be ratified by Frederick the Great. Um, the earliest known copy uh, is in the hands of Reverend Dalco, and it's, or excuse me, was written in the hand of Reverend Dalco, um, early member of the council, obviously. And, and there's much thought to, obviously, the veracity and authenticity of this document. Uh, but it has been pointed out by by multiple <laughs> so, uh, grand commanders since uh, whether it is is real or not, it has been the adopted law for so long uh, that it applies itself, uh, and whether um, it is a forgery or not, it has a practical value in its adoption and its use. So, obviously, these are the first Supreme Councils uh, that were popped up. Um, the Mother Council, inevitably, uh, between 1813 and 15, uh, created the Supreme Council of the 33rd degree for the Northern Masonic District and Jurisdiction. Uh, and this was created for several reasons. Um, it composed 15 states, uh, basically what I would call the Old North. If you were uh, looking at it from like a Civil War perspective in a way, um, and, and it gave them authority in that area. Um, a lot of this foundation was was likely and more importantly uh, for a control point. The constitutions, as outlined, uh, the Constitution of eighteen or seventeen eighty six, allowed for two Supreme Councils in a in the United States, one in every other country. Um, interesting that it notes that I guess they had some Frederick the Great had some forethought about the size of the country perhaps wink wink nod nod um, but it allowed for two Supreme Councils very early on in the Supreme Council history there were incursions uh, from deputy inspectors of the royal secret obviously Supreme Council is very small very early on very early on and as such um, control is very limited to Charleston, basically. South Charleston, I wouldn't even say South Carolina. Uh, over time, it does spread through the states where the inspectors are residing, which ends up tapping like Georgia, North South Carolina, um, Mississippi, and things like that. But it, it's, it's still very restricted in that, in that approach at that time. There's not a good way, even after they put out documentation like the, the manifesto, um, even after they put out circulars to reinforce their claims of authority. And so we have these deputy inspectors from the Order of the Royal Secret uh, catching wind of these situations and moving to make incursions. Uh, of course, the most prominent incursion we, we know of, uh, there, there's at least one deputy inspector who comes to the New York area um, at, at one point, uh, and this is after the, the northern jurisdictions kind of laid out, and he uh, begins to confer degrees, and they tell him he can't do it within 50 miles. So he goes to the edge of that 50 miles and confers degrees. Uh, 
Um, the one that's most important for our attention, of course, is Joseph Cerno. Cerno has a patent uh, to confer the 25th degree of the Order of the Royal Secret once a year uh, in northern Cuba. It is pretty restricted beyond that within his authority. And he moves to New York. He's a jeweler. And he sets up shop. And as he sets up shop, uh, he begins to operate. Uh, obviously, having heard of the Supreme Council in Charleston, uh, he begins to assert his own authority, uh, sets up his own Supreme Council, brings in the likes of heavy hitters politically, uh, men like uh, DeWitt Clinton, uh, governor of New York, and and later a general grand high priest and, and grand commander of the Grand Encampment. And he brings in DeWitt Clinton, uh, who becomes Supreme Commander, Sovereign Grand Commander, excuse me, uh, and he props this all up. And inevitably, uh, they actually send uh, a member of the council to investigate. And, and he claims he's going to New York for his health. Uh, very clearly, I would think he's going up there for this. Uh, and he goes and he tries to meet with the two spurious Supreme Councils that have set up shop in New York. Uh, one of them, he determines, seems more legitimate than not. Uh, the other one, when he goes to meet with Sir No's council, he meet, they meet with DeWitt Clinton uh, in the account. Uh, of the meeting, the letter they sent back to the Supreme Council, uh, they basically say that they made all these signs and gestures to DeWitt Clinton. Who knows? Uh, but there were supposed to be signs that a, a 33rd would know. A member of the Scottish Rite would know. Um, and DeWitt Clinton was oblivious. Uh, at least in, in the few of them that they did. But also, more importantly, their discussion uh, led to the fact that DeWitt Clinton believed the 33rd degree was just an office, not so much a degree, um, they and then proceeded to meet with Sir No. Um, Sir No, they, they did the signs obviously with as well. He did not respond to anything. Uh, he claimed his authority was good, he wouldn't show his books, things like that. Uh, and inevitably, things like that led the dominoes to move very quickly, and the northern jurisdiction was set up. Now, their territory wasn't explicitly laid out at that time, uh, in the 1315 window. Uh, so almost uh, 10, 11, 12 years later they fixed that territory at those 15 states. And thus you have the Northern jurisdiction and the Southern jurisdiction as they now exist. The ritual of the Scottish Rite, of course, is an ever moving target uh, early on in its development. Um, inevitably, the ritual comes to us uh, in various ways. Um, the early ritual, if you were to look at the Order of the Royal Secret material, uh, in a lot of ways, it's very skeleton based. Uh, there might be a lecture, there's an obligation, there's, there's Fabulous descriptions of rooms and ornate arrangements, um, but most of these early degrees were communicated, uh, being read off a of paper, one on one, or or in a lodge setting, perhaps with some some paraphernalia, but very much communicated more than probably conferred outright. Um, of course, a damper to all this is the eighteen twenty six Morgan affair, um, and that really comes in, obviously, as the Supreme Council is really starting to get more of a solid foundation. Um, Anti-Masonry comes in and it hits uh, many lodges. Of course, New York sees massive decimation as it kind of originates up there. The Scottish Rite faces challenges. The northern jurisdiction um, more or less goes dormant for a time. Um, there's actually some, some consternation. I would draw your attention to a book called Light on Masonry uh, by Bernard. Um, but republished by the uh, Scottish Rite Research Society. Uh, and Art De Hoyos, illustrious De Hoyos, does a, does a nice write-up and review of the text and some commentary. And one of the things they discuss is the fact that the Scottish Rite ritual for the Lodge of Perfection um, had been transmitted between several individuals. And it's believed uh, that Bernard, who ended up becoming an anti-Mason and writing an expose, uh, got that ritual from a brother. Um, and those involved in the Scottish Rite in New York uh, denied that, claimed they never gave it away, that type of thing. But it, but it seems very likely um, that we, we even fed our own fire against us, at least to a degree. In any case, anti-Masonry causes some major ramifications. Um, and as a defense to all that was occurring, Screen Council passes a resolution uh, in 1826 that outlines that all ritual manuscripts need to be deposited in the archives. Uh, this is based on several other issues and situations. Um, one, of course, being uh, that when Frederick Mitchell died, um, all of his documentation was more or less lost. South Carolina was in a heavy Masonic political 
fist fight of sorts between two Grand Lodges. Uh, Mitchell was associated with one Grand Lodge. Upon his death, uh, a brother related to the other Grand Lodge showed up at his door and asked his widow for all his Masonic papers. Um, she did not know there was really a difference or wasn't aware of such differences and handed everything over. Uh, thus, a lot of the early records went poof, gone. Um, and as such, uh, rituals did get out. Some of that ritual got out into hands of local brothers in the Charleston and South Carolina area, uh, who inevitably later down the road actually had to be uh, healed and brought into the Scottish Rite for uh, sake of tying up loose ends. So Scottish Rite, of course, works quietly from this point on. Um making an effort with the ritual, uh, having collected it, but still communicating it, uh, passing framework ritual out as needed, of course, um, and going along as normal. Anti-Masonry, of course, swells it down, but things kind of ramp back up. Um, Grand Commanders make efforts to spread the right, to see it be more engaged, but we're still, even up until the 1850s, working on generally a ritual that has not changed much, not changed much, from uh, its earliest versions as handled by Mitchell and Dalco. Um, there is, a, I believe, the Holbrook revision was in between, um, which had some effect to some degree uh, with some slight shifts, but really no changes. So by 1855... Supreme Council decides that there does need to be a revision to the ritual, or review of it at least. Um, and so it encourages a committee to be formed, and we're going to talk a little bit about that momentarily. Um, but that's kind of a very important linchpin time. Now, what is worth noting in general, though, with the ritual of the rite, is that up until uh, this period, and, and perhaps even after, brothers would, even in the Order of the Royal Secret, uh, you could record, write down after the fact, you'd pay a fee, and you could write down the ritual or pieces of the ritual or whatever you needed uh, in various settings. Um, Pike himself, of course, made that transcription, um, probably didn't pay for it so much other than the shipping and mailing of the text back and forth, uh, but others did that as well. You could receive the degree and then pay a fee to write that information down um, to understand it better. So... Jumping forward, we hit the 1850s, and this is where um, illustrious Albert Pike comes into play. Of course, he is the uh, editor and compiler of Morals and Dogma. I would, I would feign to say he's the author. Um, I don't feel that's probably appropriate. Um, he never really put himself listed himself as the author on this text, um, so I would feign to do that. I would say he is more of a compiler and an editor in its use. So, a little bit about Pike. He was born in Boston, Massachusetts, which surprises some um, that he was a northerner by birth. Uh, he later traveled greatly. He resided in Little Rock, New Orleans, and Washington, D.C. By profession, um, he was an attorney, an educator, um, and he worked as an advocate in various legal spheres as elsewhere um, for the Native Americans. Um, he was involved in a plethora of other things, um, he did uh, serve in the Confederate Army. He served in the United States military via state militias. Um, his service during the Civil War uh, is poignantly short. Uh, his relationship to the Native Americans led to him being recruited for military service uh, to lead military regiments uh, that Arkansas had under their authority through Indian Territory. Um, inevitably, um, through the actions of troops in the field, which he wasn't able to completely oversee or reign in uh, through allegations of those who didn't care for him uh, and through differing political differences, he did suffer a lot of negative feedback and inevitably resigned his commission and left the service uh, fairly early in the war. But in any case, uh, very prolific uh, in his work on behalf of the Native Americans and the tribes. Uh, educator, he taught in several schools and of course his Dedication to Masonic education is profound. Uh, and then from an attorney's perspective, uh, he was admitted to the Supreme Court bar in D.C., as well as in Little Rock uh, in Arkansas and things like that, where he practiced actively. 
As a Mason, Pike was initiated in 1850 in Western Star Lodge, number one, Little Rock, Arkansas. He later went on to help obtain the charter for Magnolia Lodge, number 60, in 1854, uh, or thereabouts, and became a ma the master of that lodge there. He did receive his work in the American or York Rite uh, pretty shortly after he joined the fraternity, 1850, 52, 53, uh, for his chapter cryptic commandery work. And he was extremely active in the grand chapter in these grand York Rite bodies. Uh, and he met Albert Mackey, who, who ended up bringing him into the Scottish Rite through the grand chapter uh, and the general grand chapter. In March of 1853, uh, Mackey did communicate the 4th through 32nd degree to him. Um, that is not at all too um, out of place back then, especially to a brother uh, sought to be worthy. Um, of course, most of the time it was shorter, smaller settings and, and chunks of work, but uh, not unheard of if, if thought fitting. Uh, and that was 1853. Six years later, he's elected Sovereign Grand Commander. Um, and in between that time frame, he is uh, elected to the council itself. Pike, of course, um, very big in ritual. Um, he received the early ritual manuscripts of the work that he received from Mackey, and he was able to copy it. Uh, he copied other rituals that were provided him as well. Uh, this is, was developed into a text that we now call Formulas and Rituals. Uh, you may be able to find that for sale in the secondary market uh, for an exorbitant price. Uh, it used to be published and sold uh, through the Scotch Rite Research Society and then the Scotch Rite store had it for a while, uh, but I believe those are all sold out and gone. Um, that ritual, of course, shows the early Scottish Rite degrees, the early understanding of the work. There's even little notations in there about this is the degree I received or this is how I received it. I didn't receive this that that way that type of thing from pike of course pike himself wasn't satisfied with these early versions of the degree because they seemed to be at least dis disconjunctive to him uh they seems the meanings were veiled or lost um and they weren't as impressive as he thought they should be two years after joining the right he was assigned to a special committee to revise those rituals that we mentioned um pike himself uh, took the time to work through these rituals, to press through these rituals, and to apply himself, if you will, um, to the effort um, of actually really making something happen. Really making something happen. And he presents these, these rituals um, along to the Supreme Council, the other members of the committee um, representing, uh, including John Honor, uh, W.S. Rockwell, C. Samory, and, and Mackey himself, uh, produced no results. Pike was the lowest ranking member of the committee. He was not a member of the council. Um, he was a 32nd degree. The remainders were 33rds, that type of thing. Um, he really kind of was low man on the totem pole. And so he, he writes these revisions, he produces them, um, and he fleshes them out. Of course, this becomes what we now call the magnum opus. Um, and he passes that onward um, to the committee, uh, or at least to the Supreme Council, to the membership. Uh, it's called the magnum opus by Mackey. Pike didn't call it himself that. Um, and it was never adopted the content, content of the work did make it into other ritual um, in various ways. It did make it into later revisions, not all of it, not word for word, but in large part, in large, large part. Um, and, and as such, um, became kind of the skeleton foundation of what we now know as our ritual. Uh, of course, in his ritual revisions, Pike did reach outside of his direct circle. Uh, one of those highly involved was Charles Lafon de Lavat. Uh, his brother was out of New Orleans, very active down there. Uh, and inevitably, uh, they became good friends, at least in one way or another, so much so that uh, Le Bat gave up his seat on the Supreme Council for Pike to be elected to the council. Um, so 
again, talking a little bit more about these revisions. This first revision that Pike developed took two years in full. Um, he, of course, used some material he'd already created in various ways, including his, his article, What Masonry Is and Its Objects. He used some other speeches, some other things, uh, back and forth between magnum opus. Uh, the magnum opus contains most of the text we find in morals and dogma, uh, at least in a large part. After Pike's election as Grand Commander in 1859, he knew revisions needed to actually go through and be done since the last call for revisions and the effort was set aside. He spent over 10 years working on what he called the long labor of the right uh, and inevitably produced rituals uh, prolifically, prolifically in revision um, for the bodies, so much so um, that he was uh, able to come full circle with this to printing the rituals of the first through 32nd, the liturgies of the first through 32nd, constitutions, installation ceremonies, and funeral ceremonies. Um, he prints all these, um, and, and he starts moving forward with this. Um, and he makes more tweaks. It is important to note. Uh, the first round of these revisions comes out in um, as early as the as 1870 and a little bit before um, and continues um, pushing uh, up until the 1880s, mid 1880s. Now, Morals and Dogma itself um, is thought to provide a ceremonial or excuse me, a philosophical backdrop to the ceremonies of the degree. It was originally published in two parts. Um, it is no worthy of noting that very often they will call morals and dogma uh, a piece of comparative religion. And, and it's not the first book on comparative religion. That also gets thrown around. Um, but it is a, a text which looks at those ideas, perhaps. Um, this process to begin publishing began in the early 1870s. Um, and took a little bit of time as Pike worked with McCoy publishing um, and, and tried to uh, get the material done um, because over time uh, he wanted to get this pushed out. Of course, there's also the problem funding it. Do they have the funds for it? Generally speaking, uh, the Supreme Council did not. It was pretty, pretty rough off most of the time. And, and as such, um, Funding had to be raised. Pike fronted cash himself um, and, and pushed it. Of course, in the background, Pike also owes McCoy money for other projects, uh, things like diplomas, um, a book he wrote of his own poetry, um, all these other things um, that Pike was having published by McCoy. Now, Morals and Dogma itself should be considered in the context of its time. I think that's a very important comment, very important thought process. Uh, it's an intellectual pursuit. It is using the comparative method of thought. Uh, and it's Pike's private exploration to the underlying philosophy of the Scottish Rite. It's not dogmatic explicitly. Um, it's not meant to be taken as gospel. Um, it's meant to explore, probe make you consider. Pike's preface to Morals and Dogma states that anyone is free to reject or accept any part which they choose not to accept. And Morals of Pike, or excuse me, Morals and Dogma doesn't actually represent Pike's best writing uh, per various Masonic scholars. It's in very much uh, a cobbled manner uh, in that approach. It, it is a work of beauty. It is a work of quite impressive nature, but uh, not, not as best when you look at the scope of everything else he did. Of course, the scope of Pike's approach to morals and dogma uh, lends itself to a lot of different opportunities to consider masonry, uh, but also opens itself to many different um, interpretations, different thought processes. And a part of that uh, is understanding Pike's ideas, Pike's thoughts, um, and we have a visitor, but that's beside the point. Pike approaches uh, the mysteries uh, and masonry kind of through Varying lenses, but the same lens. And I think it's important we note that 
Um, he, of course, tells us that masonry was the successor to the mysteries in its manner of teaching, its manner of instruction. Um, and, of course, statements like that and others uh, in his text are often taken out of context. They're construed. This is quite a text, very long, very thorough, lots of statements. Uh, we know you can often take a statement out of a paragraph and completely miss something um, in that sense. Uh we have people like Leo Taxel, who, of course, creates the hoax about Pike worshiping the devil and Masons being satanic and Luciferian. Uh, of course, that comes from that statement uh, about Lucifer, a strange name for the Prince of Darkness. Of course, Lucifer meaning light bearer. Uh, just an interesting kind of train to go under when we think about Pike approaches this in such a broad way that um, it leads a lot of different paths. And, and it is fodder fodder for anyone uh, who does not understand the context, who does not take time to read it as a whole, or to at least read the chapter of a degree as a whole, um, because you'll miss out on the nuances of where he's going with it. Now, this is, of course, a, a text that it really is, as I noted, Pike is not the author, he's a compiler in many ways and an editor. Uh, he pulls from a lot of different people. Um, intellectual property was not what it, it is today. Uh, very different views, very different thought processes. And, and Pike pulls from plenty of different people. Uh, Charles Dickens, Victor Hugo, George Oliver, Jeremy Taylor, Thomas Taylor, um, Elphus Levy, various other esoteric writers, uh, philosophers. It just goes on and on um, who he took bits and thoughts and processes from as he wove things together. It's, it's worth weighing. It's worth our own understanding and consideration. Now, of course, when the text is finally put together, it's finally printed in 1872 uh, after Pike has been sending manuscript paperwork, loads of it up there. Uh, he's been facing the financial challenges of getting it published, paid for, uh, but McCoy's gets it out. Um, now, of course, there are certain editions that have been published that carry the notice that it's an es in the very front that it's esoteric book for Scottish Rite use only to be returned upon withdrawal or death of the recipient. This was generally created to discourage others from republishing unauthorized extracts. Of course, that hasn't worked. Uh, and if anything, it's actually probably created more headaches for Scottish Rite bodies uh, as we get mountains of morals and dogma returned to us uh, as brothers pass. Um, I know many a library probably could build a new wall uh, or a new cathedral just with the morals and dogma copies that are stored in it. The price originally in 1872 converted over uh, to today's money um, would be $106. Um, the actual first 500 copies were printed uh, cost about a dollar and they were sold for five uh, to kind of catch the, the end there. Um, although rare, if you were ever to see a copy that is with the page date Charleston AM, 5632, that would be one of the original printings. Um, Morals and Dalma has been reprinted in various editions uh, multiple times um, with really nothing much than maybe the pagination shifted and some typographical corrections. That only substantial change, that notice I mentioned, the esoteric notice, um, was put through um, – in the 1840s, the late 1840s, by John Henry Coles, Grand Commander. So, um, interesting text, um, very beautiful text, uh, but, but quite a beast to get out. Now, what does it do for us today? Um, why do we find it functional? Well, Morals and Noma serves us as we explore our own philosophical understanding of fraternity. It helps us consider certain ethical and moral dilemmas, um, our own actions, our virtues, our lessons. And it, it works in placing Masonic morality and ethics within the context of general society. It is worth noting that, that Pike follows several commentaries here. Um, he does discuss at length some of the ideas of the solar myths, um, some of the errors of other thought processes, um, as they come through um, and, and inevitably he, he was tied to several other efforts including um, while not directly 
related to the Morrison dogma. Um, his views uh, do mention at least some of the issues with suppressing the Scottish Rite ritual in England, uh, which we'll talk about later uh, when we talk about some of the relationship to requirements on membership in religion. Pike himself, in regards to religion, um, tackles it pretty plainly. He does speak of religion in several ways. Uh, he understands that pagan gods are not a reality, rather the expressive force of nature. And he speaks of the practices of noble and virtuous sentiments found in the Bible. Um, he doesn't explicitly ever really state that he is Christian, uh, although we would find that to be the tinge of his thought process based on other comments across the board in various ways, or at least that he had an extremely profound respect for the Christian faith. Uh, he did reject uh, the substitution of the phrase princi creative principle in masonry. Uh, so belief in a creative principle rather than a belief in God. He did reject that idea that came about in various places. And he talks about it um, in the text when he talks about the divine. Some other thoughts just relating Pike, relating to this text. Um, he uses and references certain Masonic historical points, things that he pulled from authors like Robert Gould. Uh, Gould was a well-known historian uh, who he says is probably one of the most gifted of the scholars and antiquaries. Uh, whose writing from time to time can luster on the literature of Freemasonry. Uh, Pike also takes it within the preface and some of the thought points to talk about Freemasonry's purpose and what it does. It's a march towards and struggle toward the light. It's useful to all men. It's not made for cold souls and narrow minds. And Masonry is engaged in our crusade against ignorance and tolerance and fanaticism. And I think if we've experienced the Scottish Rite degrees, we, we can punch this ticket and buy into all of those. Uh, Pike also, of course, takes some time to discuss the mysteries, to discuss uh, secrecy in the mysteries uh, as well. And, and the mysteries are going to play a key part in this text. Of course, what was the overall object of the ancient mysteries? Uh, it was to explore where we came from, why we're here on Earth, where we go after we die. Um, and this notion that the mystery of religions originated in India, Pike seems to kind of chase that to some degree uh, in one way or another. It's untrue. It's not. It's unfounded. Um, so keep that in mind. Pike will discuss as we go on. Very big later in in his ideas and his concepts as he grew regarding the idea of Indo Aryan thought and philosophy and religious practice uh, as a gateway to understand the divine better. And he of course mentions that even to the Freemason for whom the Bible is not the revealed truth, the material universe is the manifestation of its creator. Uh, as he discusses this idea of approaching the, the divine, the mysteries and such. Of course, mysteries themselves, uh, and with masonry being an inheritor to the mysteries, at least in its base idea of secrecy in, in tradition and teaching practices, uh, he pokes to the point that mystery denotes a secret rite or doctrine, the Latin being mysterium, the Greek mysterion, the word mystes meaning someone who has been initiated, and it comes from the root word meaning to shut out or to close. Uh, of course, we're given several other comments to this and, and thought processes in regards to this um, from other angles. Um, and, and very similar to, to uh, traditions in, in the mystery schools and things, um, the Disciplani and Kari uh, or the Disciples of the Secret, or an early Christian mystery tradition. Uh, and they, just as the other mystery schools, uh, the more pagan mystery schools, imposed obligations of secrecy regarding that their general principles be withheld from the general me uh, membership. Uh, this subject itself will be discussed uh, in the 26th degree a little bit. So uh, keep your ears peeled for that. In closing our discussion on the introduction, um, I would encourage you to look for two things in the text uh, and to ponder one, uh, an actual thing. And then the other for your own deliberation, what is the only definition of religion found in the Bible? Where is it? Um, and then what is the most important thing that you picked up from the introduction? Uh, with that in mind, we're going to close our discussion on the introduction today. When we come back with the second installment uh, section, or excuse me, Part two of section one, we'll be exploring, begin to explore the craft lodge of the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry and begin with the degree of apprentice. We'll see you then.